Okay, well, it looks like we're live and it's seven o'clock, so maybe we'll uh, get started. I can see people are rolling in, uh, participants are rolling in, so uh, thank you all for joining us. It's uh, just after seven o'clock. I'm Jesse Zima. I'm the Director of Fish and Wildlife Restoration with BC Wildlife Federation. I uh, really like to thank everyone for joining us. I think we're just over a year now. This might be webinar 13, 12 or 13. Um, so a few of the, the ground rules and kind of the agenda, uh, Dr. Walters will do, you know, probably 30, 45 minutes of presentation. We'll do some Q&A at the end. Uh, you can ask your questions in the chat box. And if you're on Facebook Live, you can just put them right in the comment section. We will aggregate them and then ask Dr. Walters at the end. Uh, keep in mind that uh, Dr. Walters is a researcher. He is not a policymaker or a politician. So if you, uh, you know, I would say if you feel your blood pressure is raising, then you're best off picking up a pen and paper or going and meeting with your MP or MLA and exp expressing your concerns with them rather than um, sending your questions to Dr. Walters. Um, this webinar series, really the intent is to educate people as individuals. Um, it's great that you have this knowledge, but the important piece is that you translate that into advocacy and other people knowing. So when you learn about what is going on and what Dr. Walters has to say, you can talk to your friends who love salmon and the people that you work with. And uh, for those of you that engage with your MLAs and MPs regularly, you can take this message to them. So that's the spiel, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Walters. I could probably spend all of the first 45 minutes telling you about all of his accomplishments. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a world-class researcher here. So Dr. Walters is a professor emeritus in the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He completed his doctoral degree in 1969 from Colorado State University and has been at UBC since then. He's participated in over 200 peer-reviewed publications, has won several major awards, including the Volvo Environment Prize, American Fishery Society Award of Excellence, and ICE's uh, Prix d'Excellence. His research inter interests include fish population dynamics, ecosystem modeling, and adaptive management. He's been particularly interested in the long-term dynamics of BC sockeye populations, finding simple but effective stock assessment methods, and development of simpler models for understanding ecosystem impacts. Um, you know, I, I'm just gonna save it all. Dr. Walters is the person who you wanna hear from. And we could go on about his accomplishments all night, but I don't wanna tie up all of his time. So with that, uh, Dr. Walters, I'd just like to thank you, first of all, for taking your time and then turn things over to you. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen here. Did that work? My screen got shared. Oh, why is it not? There we go. Perfect. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take you through a bit of a story here that involves a bit of my most of my career actually, trying to sort out uh, causes of declines in salmon populations uh, and other populations in British Columbia. Now, just to uh, let you know who I am, since I'm talking to uh, Fish and BC Wildlife Federation, uh, I grew up in a cattle ranching family in a small desert town in California. I grew up hunting and fishing. I caught my first trout on a fly when I was six years old and shot my first deer when I was 13. When my family lost a ranch to the city of Los Angeles, took our water. Grandpa was a, became a game warden. My dad was a fishing guide for a while. I started my research career on high mountain lakes and fisheries in high mountain lakes in the Sierra Nevada and uh, Rocky Mountains. When I came to BC, I caught my first coho about a month after I moved to BC under right off the mouth of the cap. And I've caught a few hundred of those over the years since then. I started working on the Georgia Strait fishery that's going to be much of what I talk about today. I started working on that in 1978 with biologists from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. 
And that's where the story, the science story here and the, and the problems that I'll be talking about began. Uh, just before I, uh, I start this, I wanna say something about fish stock collapses. Uh, there, a lot of fish stocks around the world have collapsed and some researchers at my organization at UBC have urged you to believe that the main cause of those collapses has been overfishing. That assertion is false. Uh, on about half of the fish stocks that we know where we can figure out roughly what happened during the collapses, collapsed before fishing became a severe problem. They were collapses due to other factors. And that's the case here in BC. We've had a series of collapses that we can show were not due to overfishing. In herring stocks and Georgia Strait, Chinook and coho salmon, off-cycle sockeye stock, steelhead ulican, uh, that have shown these abrupt declines and have caused a great concern in, in fisheries management today. And in, in none of those cases can we, uh, we demonstrate that overfishing was the cause of the collapse. Uh, 20 years ago, I published a book on, uh, on fisheries uh, population dynamics and management. And I put this chart in the book to show people just how, how difficult it is to figure out what's going on. So this, is, this chart shows the, uh, let me put the pointer up so you can see it. This chart shows the history from about 1960 of, to, to 2000 when I wrote the paper of Chinook salmon sport catches in the Georgia Strait. So the Georgia Strait sport fishery, like many sport fisheries in North America build up quite a bit uh, up to the early 1970s and peaked in 77, 78, around that time. Uh, it, just about anybody could go out there and catch a Chinook or a coho salmon in the Georgia Strait. The fishing was easy, you hardly ever got skunked. But then uh, starting in the late 1970s, around the time when I started working on the population here, uh, we started to see this precipitous decline during the early 1980s. And because this was one of these cases where the catch had gone up and peaked and gone down, we immediately blamed the problem on overfishing. We thought we were dealing with overfishing. And uh, a whole series of fisheries regulations were introduced. There was a sports package of regulations. They closed the uh, commercial troll fishery in the Georgia Strait. They put in spot closures and so on, and eventually size limits that prevented people from catching small Chinook salmon and so on. Regulation after regulation, and none of them reversed the decline. The decline just kept on down. So it was clearly not due to overfishing. If it had been, the decline would have reversed and the stocks would have recovered. Uh, other thing we started to blame was habitat loss, but there wasn't any serious habitat loss for the major Chinook stocks. They spawn in big rivers that are relatively healthy like the Harrison River. Uh, then uh, we decided maybe this was fish hatcheries because there was a big increase uh, up to about 1985 here in fish hatchery production. And we thought maybe the hatcheries were, uh, were competing with the wild fish and driving the wild populations down. But then the hatcheries production stopped growing and started going down over time and still the survival rates kept going down. So we weren't able to keep blaming the hatcheries. And then another thing that came along, we started to blame fish farms because uh, they started farming Chinook salmon here in 1986 and fish farming built up really dramatically by, uh, by about 2000. But you can see that most of the decline was already passed before the fish farming even started. So we, we can't blame fish farming for what happened out there. So we were basically at a loss to explain this pattern. There was one guy, uh, a technician who was a BC uh, Wildlife Federation person also, Wayne Harling, a technician for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and an avid fisherman. And he was the first one to really, about 1990, early 1990s, started warning of about potential impacts of seals. He was fishing a lot off Nanaimo. He saw a lot of seals. He saw a lot of fish pulled off his line and so on like that. And so uh, he, and also he was a friend of uh, a biologist uh, named Peter Elisiak. And 
what finally made me realize that we might very well be dealing with a pinniped problem was when Peter Alicia published his, started publishing his work. Uh, Peter uh, is a, one of the best marine mammal biologists around and he, starting in, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, he started flying the BC coastline and photographing and counting seals and stellar sea lions along the coast, particularly around the Georgia Strait. And uh, he, so he'd count every, every animal he could see. And they did, he did a lot of work figuring out how to expand the uh, population estimates from what you could see hauled out to how many weren't, weren't hauled out in the water and so on like that. He also did work on what we call bioenergetics, figuring out how much each seal was eating. And he studied diet habits and so on. And he started to uh, warn that these things were could be generating a growing impact on a variety of fish stocks in BC. Another really neat thing that Lisiak did was to reconstruct back in time how many uh, seals had been killed by commercial harvesting and government culling programs over the years. And he, he carried those, he dug up records back to about uh, almost to back to 1880. And using those long records, we were able to figure out how big the uh, seal population had to have been before he started his work in order to have sustained the, uh, the harvests that were removed from the population. And he made this really striking discovery, which was that the uh, seal population back in 1880 was nowhere near, likely nowhere near as large as it is today. And when you stop and think about it, that makes a great deal of sense. Seals and sea lions were prized by First Nations people for their meat and other products or hides and so on. And they were hunted intensively along the coast until smallpox outbreaks in the 1860s and 1880s devastated the First Nations populations. So it's quite possible that over the last several millennia, the population sizes of seals and sea lions were much, much lower than they are today. In fact, it's very probable that they were much lower than they are today. The sea lion population is still growing. The seal population has stabilized at around 100,000 uh, harbor seals along the coast. When we uh, look at how much sea lions in, eat in particular, a, a really scary statistic that I, I put together help me realize we might be dealing with a serious problem is you take the number of sea lions we estimate to be out there and multiply that times how much they eat, need to eat each day and how many days there are in a year, you come out that they're consuming about 300,000 tons of fish a year. Uh, the total commercial harvest of all kinds of fish in BC and aquaculture salmon production is a little less than 300,000 tons a year. So sea lions alone are uh, consuming more fish out there than, than all of our fisheries and uh, commercial fisheries in BC combined. Another thing is that there was a reconstruction of the long-term history of commercial uh, catches of Chinook and coho salmon from the 1880s forward uh, done back in the 1950s. And the guys that did that argued, noticed that even though there were intense commercial fisheries in places like the Fraser River, net fisheries that should have caught a lot of Chinook and coho salmon, they caught very few of them. And the Chinook and coho catches didn't build up in British Columbia until uh, this period when culling, intense culling had reduced to seal populations. So we had this long period of high and sustained yields during a period when the uh, seal and sea lion abundances were relatively low. And then as these pinniped populations rebuilt, we began to see declines in Chinook and Coho. And then there was an abrupt, uh, really abrupt decline in catches uh, uh, when the fisheries were almost shut down in, in 1997. Uh, with the initial main objective of protecting interior phaser coho from interception in a whole range of fisheries where the, uh, that declining population was being caught. So we have evidence now that we're dealing with a situation that is completely unnatural relative to at least the last several thousand years along the British Columbia coast, unnatural in terms of 
uh, presence of large dominant predators that eat a wide variety of fish and are very efficient at, uh, at feeding. Now, when we want to study something like this, there's to assess these impacts, we use two main methods. One of them was statistical comparisons of mortality rates and, uh, and abundance changes with changes in predator abundance. So essentially, statistically saying of increase in predator pinniped numbers being correlated with the changes in mortality rates and abundances. I just showed you a picture that gives a rough idea that, that that has happened. And then we also, uh, as a second way of looking at it, we do direct calculations of possible predation rates using prey abundance estimates and estimates of how much the pinnipeds eat and what their diet compositions are. So we had a bunch of grad student or grad student out in the Georgia Strait collecting seal scats about 10 years ago and uh, looking at what percentage of the, of the, of the scat DNA was from uh, juvenile coho and Chinook salmon uh, in particular. So let's just ask, ask the question, could the pinnipeds possibly be eaten enough to account for the measured mortality changes? I got to warn you that this kind of approach to the analysis of, of uh, trophic interactions in ecology you got to watch out about at least three things. The first thing is that correlation doesn't imply causality. Those mortality changes that we've seen uh, in Chinook and Coho are also correlated with other factors that have exhibited long-term changes. In particular, water temperature has been increasing over the period when the stock and the stocks declined. Uh, another thing is what's called non-additive mortality. We can't be sure that the fish eaten by the pinnipeds wouldn't have died anyway. It's possible that there's some factors like disease that's built up over time that's weakening those fish and making them vulnerable to the pinnipeds. And if the pinnipeds hadn't eaten them, then those weak fish would have been killed by something else. So they'd have died anyway, whether or not the seals uh, ate them. And the only way we can find out whether that's the case is to remove the, the predator effect and see if the uh, survival rates uh, don't improve. Another thing, though, that operates in the other direction is that predators can kill their prey without eating them. This is a hot topic in ecology. Predators can cause mortality rates higher than expected from how much they eat because they trigger prey to exhibit risk sensitive or what we call ecology of fear foraging behaviors, i.e. they don't spend as much time feeding because they're scared all the time and they don't eat as much, they don't grow as well. And that reduction in growth uh, leads to reduce, can lead to reduced survival rates. So it's possible that even if the, if the seals weren't eating them, that the buildup in predation risk out there could be causing uh, Chinook and Coho to, uh, to forage less efficiently and to try to stay in places where they're safer, like get down deeper in a water column, and that'll reduce their efficiency uh, growth and then their survival. There's a lot of interactions going on. Uh, as I mentioned, there's been a long history of sustainable harvest management in British Columbia, but as these abundance declines started to occur, and particularly coho decline, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has radically reduced the exploitation rates, the percentage annual removal rates from the returning adult populations have been reduced by uh, more than 60% over time. So about half of this catch decline is due to reduction in exploitation rate. And the remaining part of the decline is due to some increase in mortality rates that's going on out there. Uh, making those populations less productive. And uh, that, uh, those impacts are occurring across pretty much all, all the salmon species. Although pinks and chums are so variable, you never know really what you're looking at with the long-term data with them. Uh, now, this Georgia Strait, here's a, a more complete reconstruction of the Georgia Strait history of uh, Chinook catches. This is part of the Chinook catch history that I showed you. Uh, and, uh, oh, actually this is fishing effort. That's, that's the, 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 from 1970 up near the peak down to the crash of the Chinook. Coho catches were much more erratic, uh, partly because coho uh, 
in some years don't remain in the Georgia Strait, they move out. So when some of these high catches are when a high proportion of the coho stay in the strait rather than migrating out. And, but then it crashed and then, uh, yeah, we, we did the big fishery shutdown. The important thing is that over this period from uh, the mid seventies onward, we started coded wire tagging programs that measured uh, coded wire tagging tens of thousands of juvenile salmon as they were released from hatcheries and in a few wild populations. And what we saw is a progressive decline in the percentage of those uh, coded wire tag fish that were surviving their first ocean year. So the decline in abundance here is not because there was a decline in how many juvenile fish were going to the ocean. That has remained high even to this day, uh, especially with supplemental supplementation from hatcheries. But what, what caused the decline was a decline in this first ocean year survival rate. Okay, and most of that first ocean year mortality we think is occurring in the first six or eight months uh, after they leave the streams in, in April and May. Uh, as the uh, stock size dropped, uh, combined abundance dropped with Chinook and Coho, there was a huge drop in sport fishing effort in the Georgia Strait. And that meant severe economic problems for a number of small communities around the Strait like Campbell River that for which that sport fishing effort was a major source of uh, employment and income uh, to all sorts of recreational uh, things like boat rentals and guiding fishing and hotels and so on, everything. So it had quite a severe impact as the effort went down. When we uh, look at the more at the survival rates that I showed you a minute ago, and we convert them to more, from survival to mortality rates, which are easier to study, and we, we plot those mortality rates, they're very highly correlated with the abundance of seals. So seal buildups are very well correlated with the mortality rates of both Chinook and Coho. The, uh, the increase here is oh, the slope of this mortality rate line, the mortality added per seal is almost exactly what we predict from diet studies on the uh, consumption of juvenile salmon per seal. Right, so the, uh, the number of little fish added to the kill and the mortality rate for each seal lines up with, with diet composition and food consumption estimates. So that's correlative evidence that uh, supported also by the functional feeding evidence that uh, mortality has changes have been driven by, uh, uh, or at least very well related to the abundance of the seals in the Georgia Strait. Now, when you, one source of concern is that for coho salmon, we have these uh, mortality rate estimates for a bunch of different coho salmon populations from different hatcheries and a couple of wild populations. And they, all the different populations around the Georgia Strait have shown pretty much the same increase in mortality uh, with seal abundance. But when we look at Chinook salmon, we see a much more variable story. Some of the uh, stocks outside the Fraser River, like the big Qualicum and Cowichan and so on, show uh, first ocean year mortality rates that go up quite clearly with increasing seal abundance. But when we look at Fraser stocks, uh, the Harrison and Chilliwack and so on, where we have some color wire tagging, we don't see anywhere near as clear a relationship with seal abundance for those stocks, even though their overall abundances uh, have gone down. One suspicion here is that the Kodawar tagging information is uh, problematical for those uh, Fraser Chinooks. Uh, so a couple of years ago, a proposal was developed for a sustainable First Nations fishery uh, for seals as a means to both uh, restore the sport fishery and to provide some economic opportunity for First Nations people to sell uh, seal products. Uh, and that proposal was to reduce the seal abundance to what we call the MSY or uh, most productive population size about half, which is at about half of its peak natural size. And to keep that, po that population down at that level through a sustained harvest over time. 
Now we already looked at this with different kinds of models and they all give the same basic prediction, base, base, same basic fit to the historical data and this is a prediction. Uh, some people have argued that this population build up to an abrupt stop growing in 1990. That's not, that's not true. The difference between this year and this year, the year after is larger than any seal population could actually exhibit in nature. This, this is an observation error. It's above the, it's above the trend that the biology is capable of giving. So we, uh, we built this little spreadsheet computer model where we put the uh, historical hatchery data together with uh, uh, productivity estimates for the wild stocks and historical uh, uh, relationships between fishing effort and, and, uh, and mortality rate and, and abundance of the fish. And, and we just kind of fitted that model to the data and then uh, projected it forward with this reduced seal population by 50%. And the basic prediction is that it would result in a modest recovery of catches in the fishery. Uh, uh, a, a substantial recovery in escapements, that is con a substantial contribution to uh, conservation performance measures for the stocks, and a quite a substantial response uh, in uh, sport fishing effort and the economic benefits of the sport fishery. Fair enough. So that's all based on the proposition that predation mortality is additive. But because that seal reduction is uncertain as to whether the mortality is additive, any, any reduction like I showed you in the previous graph would have to be thought of as an experiment with a highly uncertain outcome. Uh, there was one proposal came out a couple of years ago uh, from I think it was the Sport Fishing Institute and so on that maybe we should just call problem seals so that eat juvenile salmon as they're coming down the river and, and adult salmon as they're coming back to spawn. Uh, that wouldn't work. The diet data that we have show that the uh, number of uh, juvenile Chinook and Coho eaten uh, is fairly high right through uh, May, June, July, and August and all the way into September based on diet. So, so most of the consumption of juvenile Chinook and Coho by uh, by seals is not occurring at the river mouths when they first enter the ocean. It's occurring much later. And the, in terms of daily mortality rates, the mortality rates are highest actually in August and even later when the uh, number of juveniles is much lower. So eating one of them has a bigger effect on the, on the mortality rate. So this idea of problem seals is a lose-lose policy option. It'd be hugely unpopular and it, it wouldn't solve the problem. It wouldn't reduce the, the, the mortality rate substantially at all. I suspect this, this idea was put out there by biologists who wanted, to, wanted the policy to fail. They knew it would be a dumb thing to do. Now, let me... Uh, since I'm okay here on time, let me let me turn and talk for just a few minutes about my favorite fish, the sockeye salmon. So the Fraser River uh, supports probably about 90, maybe 100 genetically distinct uh, sockeye races with all manner of lo really cool local adaptations to circumstances. Like way up here, up around the Takla Lake area in the north end of the Fraser, the longest migrating fish that come in the earliest. Those fish spawn really early in September. And what happens is their, uh, their eggs hatch around December and they hatch so early because the streams get hold fast ice that will kill the eggs, the ice on the bottom of the streams up north there. So these fry from those stalks migrate down into the gravel, about a meter down in the gravel and they hang around down in there until April or so and then come out and enter the lakes uh, in April and May when, when the food supplies are good for them. So just all through the system, you see these remarkable ecological adaptations to extreme uh, circumstances. Uh, it's hard not to love these creatures. So, and also we have a historical data on them going back over a hundred years. 
And from when the fisheries first started in the 1880s and until the Hellsgate disaster in 1913, the Fraser Sockeye had uh, one big year out of every four and the other three years were really low. That one big year uh, was about two thirds of those would have been the uh, combination of the Adams River stock and then the Quinell stock, uh, Quinell Lake stock or horsefly uh, Mitchell system stocks on Quinell Lake. So they got nuked by, uh, by the Hellsgate disaster. And then it was a long, slow rebuilding process. And during that rebuilding, the Quinell stock came back with a different dominant cycle line than the Adams. So for a while, we had two big years out of every four instead of just one. But then a decline started, the one that triggered the Cohen Commission uh, in 2010. Uh, and as that, as that decline occurred, there was a radical reduction in exploitation rates that did not prevent the decline. So the decline kept occurring. But most importantly, the off cycle uh, low abundance, it, it, the system went back to having only one dominant line out of four rather than two. And these low years kept getting lower so that last year, not, uh, not, not this fall, but the fall before we had the lowest sockeye run since the Hellsgate disaster. And when you see a low abundance going down faster than, than anything else, the first thing you worry about is that there's what's called depensatory predation. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in relation to the uh, to the sockeye. Let me point out one kind of interesting thing about this. So from this time of the Hell's Gate until uh, eight till the mid 1990s, the sockeye stocks built rebuilt dramatically in the biodiversity. They reinvaded a lot of areas that they disappeared from and so on. Over this entire period of recovery, those stocks were being overfished. That is, they were being fished at higher exploitation rates than is best to produce yield. So even, it's just how you're gonna be careful about using words like overfishing. Overfishing doesn't mean things are gonna go extinct. Overfishing means you're catching them at higher rates than will produce the most value. And these stocks were actually being overfished while they were recovering. A, uh, it speaks to how, how, fa how productive the, this species has been in, in the Fraser system until very recently. Well, after uh, doing, looking at some of these uh, stellar sea lion consumption rates, uh, we decided to have a look at whether or not stellar sea lion could be impacting the, uh, at least the off cycle low runs of Fraser sockeye. And what triggered that is that Peter Elisiak's counts uh, for stellar sea lions during the summer show the biggest sea lion concentration on the whole coast to be right off the northwest edge of Vancouver Island. Well, when, when Fraser sockeye are coming in onto the coast, they tend to come from the northwest moving down to the southeast. A lot of them go in through the Johnson Straits and others move along the west coast of the island and then into the, into the Fraser uh, through the Juan de Fuca Strait. But whichever migration route they follow, they are basically going through a gauntlet of really high potential predation risk from sea lions. And if you do a kind of simple calculation of uh, if the sea lion numbers that we know are out there on Triangle Island and so on, or if only 10% or 15% of their diet were sockeye salmon and uh, sockeye are coming through there for about a three week, one month period in the midsummer, they could eat half of these low runs before they could get into the Johnson Straits area or up through the Juan de Fuca. So they're potentially capable of causing the, uh, the off cycle declines in Fraser sockeye. So when we, when we look at uh, fishery mortality rates, the fishery from the 60s and so on took, had really high mortality and then the mortality in the fishery dropped way down. As the stellar sea lion population build up, it actually build up enough to, uh, we calculate, potentially have higher mortality impacts than the fishery did. And what's really bad about that is that those mortality rates are worst on the low years. They're worst on the low run years. Right? They don't do anything at all to the stocks when there's a big dominant run like the Adams coming in. 
they, they could stuff themselves all day long for months and not impact on that stock. But they can have a really severe impact on the uh, depressed off cycle runs. Well, we think that may be one of the reasons why the Fraser returned to a one year cycle pattern, one out of four dominant pattern, is it got knocked off all these subdominant lines and so on. Uh, one, there's one population for which we have uh, uh, smolt data and can, uh, can look at survival rates after the fish leave the, the lakes and uh, the Choco stock. And what we see in the Choco stock is that uh, what we call M, the natural mortality rate of, the, of them over their ocean life, really goes up when, this, when in, has really gone up in years when the uh, stock size has been small relative to the abundance of stellar sea lions. That's how many fish there are relative to how many sea lions and fewer fish relative to sea lions, the higher the, mort the mortality rate has been in the ocean. And, uh, and the higher it's been as the stellar sea lion population has built up. Okay, so uh, this depensatory mortality is a major concern for a variety of fish stocks, not just for sockeye salmon, it's a concern for herring. Uh, stellar sea lions move in on and are notorious for targeting herring populations during their spawning runs. They'll sit on a herring stock uh, aggregation area for a couple of three, four months. And they're capable, and they're, because they're so, the fish are so concentrated, the, 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 the sea lions can just keep eating them on top of there's practically no fish left. We've had problems like that with fisheries, destroying stocks that are highly aggregated for spawning and so on over the years and around the world. So this depensatory mortality that uh, an efficient predator can cause uh, is defined as an increase in the mortality rate or the proportion of fish dying. It's the ratio of how many are eaten over how many are there. So when the number there is large, this mortality rate is low. When the number, uh, when the numbers uh, are low, then and, and predators still eating the same number of them, that mortality rate goes way up. Depensatory mortality can have a devastating impact on biodiversity. It can cause extinction of small stocks in small streams like small coho are disappearing from a lot of areas around the Georgia Strait. Uh, it can drive ulican stocks to almost complete extinction along the central coast and cause a long time for them to recover. And it can similarly depress herring stocks along the coast. Okay, so uh, this is a kind of warning that uh, we're not dealing here with a natural ecosystem balance. We're dealing with a situation where there's a complex ecological dynamics that can have uh, abrupt and horrible, uh, what we call depensatory or depressing effects on populations. Okay, now I want to close with just a bit of reflection here is that uh, I've been following DFO planning documents for the last few years for salmon and for other species and so on. And there's been pretty much a systematic ignoring of, uh, of evidence that people like Peter Lisiak and I have put together about uh, pinniped predation potential impacts. And so I, I want to just look, reflect for a second here about why DFO has largely uh, has not just ignored those impacts, but has, in at least one case, a steelhead recovery report for the Fraser uh, removed scientific uh, the scientists who did the report statements about uh, the risk that, that the pinnipeds were important, removed them from their planning documents. Well, part of this is a lack of objective science. So there, a lot of the, my friends and biologists who work for DFO now, some of them are students of mine, they've been taught to look for what we call bottom-up effects on populations, effects of food and climate and so on. They don't look anywhere else for impacts on populations. Uh, there's some of them that just can't seem to be able to do the arithmetic to realize that there is a potential problem. They can't multiply numbers together, I guess. And then there's uh, other scientists out there that have longstanding personal commitments to particular hypotheses and they will just keep defending them uh, and trying to prevent even discussion of alternative hypotheses in various uh, policy settings. Uh, then on, on the management side, there's uh, very obviously we've found in talking to DFO management people about uh, First Nations harvesting of pinnipeds, 
there's a, a very obvious fear of strong negative in, uh, reactions from basically misinformed environmental NGOs who are uh, fed some pretty, pretty incorrect information about pinnipeds and their potential impacts. Uh, there's also in relation to the idea that uh, a pinniped removal or harvesting experiment would be would be an experiment. There's a fear of failure, a fear that the pinniped reductions as an adaptive management experiment would not produce the desired result, and would so they then have killed a whole bunch of animals and didn't get any benefit from it in the way of fish. Uh, we found over the years in the whole area of uh, adaptive management of renewable resources that managers are fearful of adaptive management. They're fearful of the experimental uh, concept that's a core uh, con part of the adaptive management idea. And then it's also really easy to just pass the buck by, uh, by insisting on endless scientific reviews and consensus and so on. Like you can keep putting the problem off and delaying and delaying. And that's, a, you know, of course, a, uh, in action, we call it inaction as rational choice is, is a basic strategy that just about every government manager follows, whether it's in DFO or the BC Centers for Disease Control, or there's a need for a change in COVID policies, they'll delay it as long as they can get away with it. And then finally, uh, and you know, there's nothing wrong with this, of course, is uh, there, there's a lot of biologists who have real personal ethical concerns about killing marine mammals, period. I'm pretty sure that my colleague, uh, uh, one of the best marine mammal biologists in, in BC, Andrew Trice, that this drives a lot of his thinking about the science is that he, he, he wants to find scientific results that, that would avoid his killing marine mammals, period. Uh, so, basic conclusions here is that we have three three policy options about this whole benefit issue. We can just adopt radically precautionary precaution harvest policies as we're doing today. We can shut down fishery after fishery, basically let the marine mammals uh, take the surplus production that we used to harvest. Uh, we can include, uh, we can regulate marine mammal abundances just like we would any fishery and say, oh, it's just nothing any different than a whole bunch of fishing boats out there. When there's too many fishing boats, you get rid of them. That's basically a culling type policy. Or we can uh, try to restore the traditional First Nations mammal harvesting system, which would bring the populations down substantially if First Nations people are willing to use them for uh, personal and economic purposes. DFO has adopted the first strategy. They blame the stock declines on factors like climate change and their policy response to any decline is always to shut down another fishery uh, without looking at alternatives. Uh, that second thing, uh, regulating marine mammals by essentially abundances, the abundance of that fishery by culling is an extremely unpopular uh, choice and, and an unnecessary choice and a wasteful choice. Uh, going out there and just killing a bunch of animals in order to, uh, is not a, without making any beneficial use of them is an unwise policy in general. So there are active proposals to restore First Nations uh, 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 harvesting. And uh, in fact, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans now allows food and ceremonial harvesting and a lot more First Nations people are getting permits to go out and and take seals and I'm not sure whether they take sea lions yet because they're protected, but they're, they're working towards it. Uh, but they're not allowed to use those, uh, those uh, the animals that they kill commercially. So DFO has not uh, let them develop an economic incentive for uh, First Nation harvesting as of this time. And I guess now for me, what I would love to see in the last years of my life to see the Georgia Strait come back a little bit before I go, I would love to see that bold management experiment. That would be what I would do as a scientist and what I would do as a person interested in, uh, in having a future for harvesting salmon for my sons and so on. So I think I did that just about exactly on time, didn't I? <laughs> and you're not gonna, 
So there, there's a, if you can get a hold of the, the slideshow from this thing, there's a whole bunch of ad, added stuff on the end of it. It's a bunch of herring data and that that I can bring up if anybody wants to ask questions. Jesse, has, over to you. Okay, well, first of all, thank you. And yeah, you're right on time. It's almost like you've done this before. <laughs> I, I might have given the odd lecture occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's great. Uh, we'll move to some um, question and answer here. Uh, I have a few in the hopper um, and for folks, just keep in mind, uh, questions should be focused in terms of Dr. Walter's area. It seems like he's willing to talk about the policy realm a little bit, but again, keep in mind what he does and what he doesn't do. Um, so a few technical questions. We've, I think we've got some, some researchers on here. Uh, the first question is, from what I understand, uh, CWT, so I assume that's the coded oh, the wire white tag, yeah. tags, need to be retrieved to be read. Curious how the first ocean year mortalities of Chinook were captured or known through seal and sea lion scat collection or other ways? No, uh, the, uh, for Chinooks, for, for coho, we recover tags in the fisheries and in the escapement uh, after the right after the first ocean year. So there's not an issue there. With Chinooks, the coated water tags are largely recovered in fisheries to, after the fish have been in the ocean for two, three, four, or five years. So we have to do a, a back calculation of the tag recoveries from the fisheries and the escapements over multiple years to back up to what we think had to have been there at the end of the first ocean year. We don't directly observe that. Yeah, we, we do recover coated wire tags uh, from, uh, from seal haulouts and so on like that. That doesn't mean anything really. Uh, it just means that they killed some. It doesn't give us any mortality rate estimate at all. But that, that, uh, back, that need to do a back calculation of, uh, uh, to figure out how many may, uh, Chinooks made it through their first ocean year is problematical because part of that calculation involves assumptions about their natural mortality rates to be unstable over the years. Uh, and we don't think they are stable over the years, particularly we think that they've been increasing over the years due particularly to uh, increasing uh, and broad spatial scale uh, uh, consumption by stellar sea lions uh, up, all up and down the coast. They turn up. Chinook are uh, a favorite prey of marine mammals. Now, whether you're talking about southern resident killer whales that seem to depend on them, or uh, or sea lions in areas where there are chinooks available to them, they're a preferred prey. And so, as that sea lion population is built up, it's almost certain that the natural mortality rates have changed. So, some of what we thought was uh, mortality. Uh, uh, well, with mortality in the first ocean year may actually be occurring due to predation later in their marine life. Does that answer your question? Or is that... I think so. And there was the another... Coat of wire tagging. Everybody hates coat of wire tagging. It's a mess. Yeah. It's really hard to, to get good samples, particularly of the escapement of fish into spawning areas and so on. Yeah, I'll, I'll put these together thematically. So one other came in right just as this question was being answered. Can you speak to why the CWT's data for Fraser Chinook might have been problematic? What do you think happened to those tags or samples? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's it's a mid, from there, there's two uh, there's the Chehalis and uh, and Chilliwack hatchery stocks are the two stocks that are used. The uh, the Chehalis and they're both Harrison River origin Chinooks. So the Chehalis thing does show a, a, a reasonable values of survival rates and so on. The uh, the Chilliwack stock has a, a marine survival rate that's essentially impossibly high for Chinook salmon. They're, they're, they're no, we have coat of wire tagging data from literally tens of Chinook stocks all up and down the Pacific coast. Many, many, many stocks. And this thing just stands out like a sore thumb. The, 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 the numbers just aren't right. They're, they're surviving at way too high a rate. Uh, so I, I don't have an answer. Thanks. Um, the net net 
70-30 split, male to female in 2021 for uh, the chum return. They noticed a significant amount of sea lion predation in the lake this year. This male female ratio differs from ch chum returns in the Strait of Georgia this season, which was 50-50. Has any research been conducted on impact of preferential predation bias towards selecting female fish? Uh, biting out the uh, stomachs, yeah, to get at the high energy content eggs. It's something you can go out there and you can see it. But I don't know of any uh, systematic research aimed at, uh, aimed at measuring just how strong that differential impact is. And just how it affects, see, when we, when we do these consumption calculations, if we say a, a sea lion eats 16 kilos of fish a day, and that, that's equivalent to the chum, chum weighs about four kilos, that's about three or four chums a day. And that's the whole body, using the whole body weight of the chum. But if they're going out and biting out stomachs, uh, just taking a third of the body weight, they could be eating three times as many chums as our calculations indicate. So they could be having a lot bigger impact on, on spawning populations. First Nations people up, particularly in areas like Haida Gwaii, uh, have been talking about this for some time, that they think that uh, the sea lions and seals have basically uh, almost completely eradicated chum salmon from a lot of streams uh, all up and down the coast. These, these, these big animals are smart. They go where the food is concentrated and they go where the food is of the highest quality. And they ain't exactly got a conservation degree to tell them not to eat too many of them. Okay, thanks. Um, can you comment on the relative magnitude of pinniped-induced mortality on juvenile and adult salmon? Do these relative mortalities, juvenile or adult, vary between salmon species? Uh, they vary a lot among stocks. There are stocks I just mentioned, uh, like the Nitnat, where the impact on the adults is substantial, particularly small stream chum and coho populations. The impact on the adults can be much more greater than the impact on the juveniles. Uh, in terms of impact on juveniles, that's primarily Chinook and coho. Uh, there are a few cases where, uh, where uh, seals target chums like in, in Courtney you know, and, the, and the bridge there in Courtney the seals lay on the bottom of the river when the chums are coming downstream because there's these lights on the bridge and, the, the, and so the seals lay there and they catch these chum fry but they don't seem to eat much of any uh, uh, chums, pinks or sockeye out in the ocean we, we rarely see them in the, in the diet bone collections and so on it's the larger uh, Chinook and Coho juveniles that they take yeah, I should say too about that, that the, the, the predation on, uh, on, ju on juvenile Chinook and Coho is not targeted predation. We have no indication at all that seals are deliberately hunting for Chinook and Coho, except uh, for a little bit right when the uh, particular Chinooks are coming down the streams, uh, coming out of the streams. But once they get out in the ocean where most of that mortality is happening, I, it's just incidental. The seals are swimming around out there and mostly chasing herring and hake and things like that. And they see this tasty little chinooky or a tasty little coho and they'll nab it. It's a, it's a high quality food item for them. They're not going to pass it up. Thanks. Uh, we have a, yeah, and you're kind of touching on this. So should, so we'll, actually we'll start with this one. Is there any comment or effect on rockfish and lingcod related to pinniped predation? <laughs> Uh, they do eat rockfish. They, uh, they, they, they do, yeah. Uh, there was a huge decline in link cod in the Georgia Strait, but it occurred mostly before, uh, before the pinniped population buildup. So we think that that decline of, uh, uh, was probably an overfishing problem. The, the intense fisheries for link cod, and they aren't the smartest fish on the planet. They're pretty vulnerable to, to high fishing mortality rates. Uh, there's been some lingcod recovery, which in recent years uh, in areas like off Roberts Creek and so on, suggesting that uh, if there was a predation impact, it, it, it isn't severe anymore. 
Uh, but on the other hand, LinkCod, a grad student working on LinkCod, the um, what you see on reefs and how sound and so on, at least what we saw about 20 years ago, is that the link cod were growing up to about 12, 13 inches long. Uh, that's about a two year old juvenile link cod. And then they were just vanishing. They were hitting some body size and then just that was it. We couldn't find them at all. We were tagging them and so on, and they were just disappearing. They weren't moving into deeper water, they were just vanishing. Something was nailing them, and it's possible that that was sealed. The other, uh, the, well, there's one rockfish stock for which the, uh, uh, it's sort of endangered in BC, yellow eye rockfish, where the uh, calculations using models and the very, very b modest bit of diet data suggests that, uh, that the yellow eye impact from uh, seal and sea lion predation is greater than the fishery impact and that, that's preventing the yellow eye stock from recovering despite very severe fishery restrictions for it. But those are the only uh, quantitative studies I know about. Okay, and this this one, you know, trying to line up thematically. So the question is, should pinniped populations also decline if fish populations decline or collapse? Well, uh, they would have to eventually, right? Yeah, no food, they, they, they'd have to collapse. But, uh, both of the big pinniped stocks in BC, the, uh, the stellar sea lion, well, and the California sea lion is now invading us and uh, invading BC in larger and larger numbers. Uh, and the uh, harbor seal, their, their core diet is herring and hake and, and pollock. Right, so it's a, it, 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 those are big biomass stocks, uh, particularly they're big biomass stocks in the Georgia Strait. Uh, and for some reason, the uh, sea lions don't target them so much during spawning. Relatively few sea lions move into the Georgia Strait, although California sea lions are now targeting the, the Georgia Strait herring stock is huge. Uh, you get out on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and it's a different story. There's a, a lot more sea lions per herring out there. And they have had some, I think, some pretty serious impacts on, on the herring stock out there. And also up in Haida Gwaii, the, the east coast Queen Charlotte's herring stock's been hit pretty hard by predation. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, there's always, the great fallback is are the big gadoid stocks, the hake and the pollock and so on like that. that these, they're gonna be out here in huge biomasses for the foreseeable future. And that would eventually be able to support at least the, uh, the sea lions. Okay, thanks. Um, has there been any data out of the US uh, related to removal and the effect on salmon populations? Uh, not yet, no, there are uh, mostly in the US now, there are localized culling programs uh, uh, targeted on sea lions that are uh, uh, attacking spawning run adult salmon in the Columbia River and so on, and some in Puget Sound. Nobody's screwed up their courage to really do a, a serious uh, and persistent reduction, abundance reduction experiment anywhere in the States. For all, I think that all the same basic reasons that you see on the screen there about, uh, it, it's no different down South than it is here in terms of management issues. And, um, and I think you cover this to a certain extent, but maybe if you can flesh it out again, why do you say that pinniped populations are at at unnaturally high levels? Well, go look at a midden sometime. <laughs> go dig up, yeah, just about every midden along the coast has, uh, has marine mammal remains in it. Go talk to any old, any First Nation elder and they'll talk about how, uh, how the harvesting techniques that they use for seals and sea lions and porpoises incidentally and other things. When, uh, when man first invaded North America and moved down the coast, they weren't eating salmon. There weren't any salmon yet. Those rivers had not been colonized by salmon after the glaciation. What those people were were hunters. 
and they remained hunters and they were hunting marine mammals, super high uh, caloric content, high quality food. Uh, so they've been targeting them for a very long time. And they also, uh, anecdotally, they kept them away from their streams. You know, when they, when they see them building up in the stream and eating their salmon, they either eat them or chase them away. So they were certainly not uh, above doing a bit of culling, although they didn't, culling, why, why cull something and throw it away when you, when you can use its meat and use its valuable products? I have a suspicion from looking at the hunting patterns and abundance of, of native peoples in BC back around the, before 1860, that they probably kept the total population size as the seals on the coast down in around 20, 30,000 you know, maybe a fifth of what they are today. You know, seal hunting is something you can send your kids out to do. You just have them go out there and hide behind a rock in the foreshore and say, sit there all day, kid, till one of these seals comes in and then whack it with a club. It doesn't even take a boat or skill like it does with the larger uh, seal lines and so on. Okay, hey, thanks. Is there um, a reason why Chinook are a favored of marine mammals. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just look at their caloric content. <laughs> you know, you rank your basic salmon and you got uh, 6,000 calories per kilo, something like that, for a Chinook dropping to 5,000 for sockeye is the second coho around the same as sockeye. And, uh, and then, then you get next, you get chum, and then it down at about 3,000 is pinks. You know, they don't even, they don't even bother eating pinks. Yeah. It's fat content, color is, is the big dominant, and it's a dominant driver in the diets of pinnipeds in general. So they go for fatty, high fat content foods, oolicans. They love targeting the oolican runs with their high, high oil content and, and herring spawning runs, same way. Makes sense. Uh, and here's another question. Uh, from Ken, but um, he's you know talking about how he's seen some big changes uh, in terms of seal populations in the Capilano, Seymour, Lynn, Mosquito Creek. Um, how much? The question here is how much do you think seal predation is affecting the very low escapement of Thompson and Chilcolton steelhead? Uh, there was an analysis a couple of years ago by two biologists who I really respect both students of mine over the years, uh, Rob Bison and Josh Corm. Uh, and they concluded that among the various factors that they looked at for that decline, that, uh, that pinniped predation was the best statistical explanation for the, the best correlation with the decline. Uh, I uh, had a grad student do uh, acoustic tagging on steelhead in the, uh, in the, uh, coming out of the Chequemus hatchery up on the Squamish and running down the Chequemus River and down the Squamish. And in one of the two years that he was doing it, we lost almost half of our uh, tag fish to seals. And we know that because what we found was tags running back upstream at night at a meter per second, which is the seal swimming speed, when they were supposed to be migrating downstream uh, about two body, two steelhead body lengths a second. <laughs> Yeah, and we, we found uh, acoustic tags under seal, uh, under log booms were seal. But the next, the second year we did the study, the seals weren't using the log booms. And we didn't see a lot of seals and we didn't see anywhere near as much predation. So there's a lot of variability there as well. It's, there's a fellow in uh, Washington, Barry Barigian, very well-known steelhead biologist down there who has done some really detailed study on Puget Sound steelhead enter in the ocean and the mortality factors that influence them over the first part of their ocean migration. And he's pretty convinced that, uh, that uh, seal predation is a major component of their ocean mortality. Great. Um, have other Chinook or coho predators been considered or uh, is there any research applied on that end? Yeah, well, yeah, everybody, 
eat so small Chinook and coal. Birds eat them in particular uh, during downstream migrations. Other fish eat them when they get a chance. Uh, they, uh, the, even when there weren't any seals, nine out of every 10 coho that went to sea was dying before it could reach its, uh, the end of its first ocean year. So uh, all sorts of things are killing them along the way. What's happened with the, the predation impact is it's reduced it from one out of 10 surviving marginally down to, to uh, uh, one out of 50 surviving. So it's, it's, it's impacting on top, uh, we think, on top of a large number of other mortality agents that kill them at high rate. Chinooks, it's even worse. Under really good conditions, about three out of every 100 Chinooks will survive through its first ocean year, only three of them. And uh, it looks like the predation has reduced that to about one out of every 100 surviving. Big changes. Um, do you think, do you have any thoughts on the effects of offshore fisheries? Well, they're not supposed to be out there anymore. The drift, the drift net fisheries and so on. They may be, uh, they may, you never know whether they could be having some part of the impact of what we've seen in declining sockeye populations, declining ocean survival of sockeye. Uh, they could also be part of the reason in recent years that we've seen chums and pinks declining, but if, if that's going on, it's an illegal, unreported fishery, and it, it would be prosecuted by large vessels, and large vessels uh, are being monitored by satellite and VMS systems around the world now. And I'm pretty sure if there was a lot of that going on, offshore fishing going on, we'd know about it. There, there are a whole bunch of biologists that are looking really close at the satellite and uh, VMS information now coming in routinely over the web uh, globally for fishing boat distributions. A lot of people are worried about big fishing boats offshore everywhere in the world. Did we run out of, whoops. Are you frozen? Well, Carl, it looks like Jesse is frozen right now. Yeah, <clears> he noted is. that his uh, internet connection was a little bit slow. But, um, okay. but um, I don't see any more questions on the chat. And uh, I think uh, Jesse managed to get to the last one. So do you have any closing comments uh, before we wrap? No, uh, no, I guess I'm, all I'd say is thank, thank you for your attention. Uh, do your own thinking. Do your own reading. Do your own analysis. Don't trust anybody about these things. And don't trust simple-minded uh, answers that you'll hear people give you. Oh, there's Jesse back. We're, we're back. <laughs> you know, this ain't rocket science. It's some basic numbers about how many animals are out there and how many, uh, how much they eat and so on. And just about anybody, even a high school kid can do these kind of calculations. I know this because I used to have my two boys do these calculations when they were in high school. <laughs> yeah. Um, another one was, um, do you think just, and you did cover this in your presentation, do you just think calling those in the, Pinnipeds in the Fraser River will help or have any effect? And I think you did cover that, but if you want to. Oh, well, I know. I would, would, would like to say a little bit about that one is that uh, we've seen a progressive increase in upstream use of the Fraser River by seals and sea lions in recent years. It hasn't been well documented. It's mostly anecdotal information coming in from people doing monitoring on things like hooligans and that. They're very definitely targeting the Fraser Hooligan stock every April. Uh, and they're probably targeting these uh, uh, spring Chinook stocks. Some of them are in serious trouble. We went up into the river and followed them up at least as far as Mission, and in some cases, much, much further up the river. Uh, I seriously suspect that that kind of behavior by those animals would not have been uh, uh, allowed in Aboriginal times. The First Nations people would have just shut that one down cold. They'd have gotten rid of those animals for sure. 
Okay. Um, I don't know if Brian got this one. There was a question about the effect of orcas increasing and predating on pinnipeds and that uh, top-down relationship, I guess. Yeah. Uh, we, we've done some fairly careful calculations of how much uh, the transient killer whales eat. Uh, we, we have good abundance estimates for them. When we got a pretty good idea of how they build up in BC uh, since the 1970s. Uh, and they have built up. They've actually built up in BC at about the same rate as the overall BC uh, seal population, which is interesting because uh, they can't reproduce that fast. So what it is, is it's from a larger population that's growing much more slowly. More and more of them have been, uh, uh, have been used in BC as their area of primary uh, foraging. Uh, transient killer whales have this really neat kind of, one of their foraging behaviors is teaching the babies to hunt, right? So that foraging behavior involves moving along relatively close to shore and hunting specifically for juvenile harbor seals, right? So, okay, baby, you go eat that one kind of thing. Uh, it's a neat behavior. It's been known for a long time. A guy named Baird first documented it scientifically back in the early 90s, an SFU student. Uh, so yeah, uh, when we do the calculations of this, they could and probably do account for at least half of the total mortality, total number of deaths in the seal population each year in the harbor seal population and, and a higher proportion of the deaths in the juvenile. But they, they aren't the reason the population stopped growing. The seal population stopped growing before the, when the transient killer whales were still a relatively low number. So the transients had built up a lot and the seal population hadn't dropped. So what we're seeing is fairly strong behavioral reactions by the seals to uh, mediate their, it's that ecology of fear thing. They're, they're staying closer to their whole outsides. So they're, they're not swimming out as far. They're, they're, their foraging bouts are shorter and so on. So they're, uh, they're managing their predation risk by uh, transients in a way that's preventing the transients from just knocking their abundances down. And no, if the seals were knocked down, the transients are not going to starve. They eat all sorts of things and seals are half of by numbers of their diet, but only 20% by weight of their diet. And they'll, they'll do just fine eating other things. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, we're coming up on an hour and a quarter and I feel like that's, uh, you've given us more than enough of your time and that's a long lecture to be talking the entire time. So <laughs> really like to, to thank you uh, for taking the time to answer the questions, give the presentation. Um, sure, appreciate it. Uh, and for everyone who's asked questions and who has participated tonight, thanks for tuning in. And again, these webinars are set up to help educate you and bring you up to speed in terms of what's going on with fish, wildlife, and habitat in BC, so that you can share family and coworkers and MLAs and MPs. That's the important part. Is if you know if we only tell this to 150 people tonight. It doesn't do us a lot of good, but if we tell it to 20 or 30,000 people, which is kind of what, um, then we can have an impact and then people will start talking about it. So thanks again, Dr. Walters. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Appreciate the chance to talk about this. Stuff. Excellent. And, and great to meet you, Jesse. I will tell my son he's got to look you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. Now that we're, now that we can move around a little bit next time in Victoria, I will. Um, and the next webinar is next month. And actually, we're going to stick to the fish um, theme. Uh, we've got a paper that was just published by Dr. Kyle Wilson out of uh, SFU. It's titled Marine and Freshwater Regime Changes Impact a Community of Migratory Pacific Salmonids in Decline. And so his looked at um, the Keogh River. And he's looking at the ocean survival piece and the predation piece and also the, um, the freshwater environment. So it's, it promises to be a really exciting webinar. And uh, it's one of the few places that we have some, some pretty good data, which is unusual in our jurisdiction. So um, thank you all. Have a great night. Thanks to all, Dr. Walters. And hopefully we'll see you all next month, November 23rd. Good night. Good night. Good night.
<laughs> That's an old friend in the list. Yeah, yeah. All right. 